Yeah, thank you, Danielle. Welcome everyone. This is our June sites community call. We're very glad that you all could join us. These calls are part of our commitment to creating a space for our sites community of dedicated practitioners to come together safely. Today, we'll be looking specifically at how healthy landscapes improve human health and well-being. Um, we will begin with a sites program update from our program lead, Danielle Piranunzi. Um, then we'll enjoy a presentation outlining health benefits obtained from sites and landscapes. We will share a detailed case study from the beautiful Fitz Conservatory and Botanical Gardens in Pittsburgh, and we will save time at the end for Q&A. So, um, Paul, thank you for hitting record. A few quick house, uh, housekeeping items before we jump in. We are recording this session. We will be sending it out to all attendees afterwards. You will have a copy of the slides and a recording of the remarks. We encourage everyone to send questions or comments either in the chat box or to the Q&A section below. Feel free to send those throughout the presentation and we'll try to get to all of them at the end. Um, we would like to let everyone know this session is approved for one site specific CEU from GBCI. We'll be including the course ID with our follow up materials so you're able to report through there. And thank you everyone for joining us. I'd like to turn it over to Danielle Piernanzi for the site's update to kick us off. So Danielle, it's all yours. Thanks, Anna Grace. Can everybody hear me okay? Anna Grace, can you hear me? Great, thank you. Okay, great. Welcome again, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for this second sites community call for this year. Um, I'm the sites program manager at GBCI, and we are very pleased and fortunate today to have two guest speakers uh, joining us today. Dr. Kathleen Wolf is a research social scientist with the College of the Environment at the University of Washington in Seattle. Her research focuses the human dimensions of urban forestry and urban ecosystems, particularly human health. Another interest is the translation of scientific evidence for use in local government policy and planning. This included serving as a key technical advisor in developing the human health and well-being credits in the site's rating system. We will share links to her research via the chat and after the call. Mark Demico is the Studio Fitz Manager at the Fitz Conservatory and Botanical Garden. He joined the Fitz team after working as a landscape architect for Astorino Canon Design, working for clients such as the Department of Energy and the VA and Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. Martin, Mark has written in sustainable landscape design guidelines for college campuses and has consulted on design and operational improvements for various conservatories and botanical gardens. He's also a Site AP and led the effort to certify the FIPS Center for Sustainable Landscape Project uh, achieved Site's V2 Platinum Certification, the first project to achieve that level in the world. So while these calls are not intended to be introductory, I do want to provide a very brief overview of sites to those who are new and as well as some updates. Early on, the site's team embraced ecosystem services as the foundation for the site's guidelines and metrics. These services include, but are not limited to filtering air pollutants, controlling erosion, maintaining drinkable water, regulating climate, and improving human health and wellness, as we will hear more of today. Ultimately, each credit in the site's rating system considers how it would protect and enhance ecosystem services on a development project. Sites believe that any project, whether the site of a corporate campus, city park, or academic institution, has the potential to conserve and restore and create these benefits. So in addition, the rating system is guided by these four important overarching goals, which are further outlined in the rating system and reference guide. Today, we will mainly focus on the fourth goal, which is to enhance human well-being and strengthen community. This goal encourages us to design a built environment that respects our environment that, uh, and our community and reconnects us with nature to also uh, to receive those health and wellness benefits that come from that connection, but to also cultivate environmental stewardship in present and future generations. SITES is, is driving sustainability efforts beyond the building. As many of us on this call know, in order to be truly sustainable, resilient, and healthy and equitable, we must design and weave meaningful outdoor spaces into our built environment. Since its inception, SITES was developed with rigor and flexibility in mind, applying to a wide variety of project types, sizes, and locations, as you can see from these images. With that said, it is also considered a living document, which will evolve as research and experience generate more knowledge. 
the rating system here in the reference guide represent, represents a culmination of over seven years of research and field testing. This involved the input and insight from over 50 technical advisors, such as Dr. Wolf on this call, many stakeholder organizations, pilot projects, and multiple public comment periods. Sites fill an important gap in the marketplace in properly addressing the space outside of and between buildings, yet also for projects with no buildings at all. Because while every building has a site, not every site has a building. So some sites updates. In response to the global pandemic and in line with USGBC's global economic recovery strategy, sites has been evaluating and developing ways to make health and safety an even stronger priority for smart, equitable, and sustainable recovery. Our collective challenge is to support access to parks and other outdoor spaces that support physical distancing and other safety precautions. Fortunately, our community is resilient, resourceful, and hard at work managing access to outdoor spaces for all of us to enjoy. We have consolidated guidance and tools for reopening and staying open for organ from, from organizations like the National Recreation and Park Association, the Center for Disease Control, FEMA, National Park Service, U.S. Forest Service, and many others. As more information is available, we expect to expand and refine the resources. So stay tuned for this forthcoming guidance in our next newsletter. But in general, SITE believes the, for effective long-term benefits, a bigger investment in protecting and restoring nature should be at the heart of the recovery we seek. So in addition to this guidance, we have drafted a new safety first pilot credit targeted for outdoor spaces. This will be this will be worth three points and can be used by any project seeking certification. The requirements for this include using the NRPA, again, the National Recreation and Park Association Risk Assessment Tool to create an assessment and requirements for a management operations plan. The ONM plan uh, is to take precautions against the spread of COVID-19 and should at the minimum address things like physical distancing, limiting or modifying events that organize activities, and cleaning practices, workforce preparation, staff communication, measures to protect staff and the public, public communication and signage, the impact on equity inclusion in modified operations, and then all risks was identified using the NRP risk assessment. And above all, communicating and training the relevant parties on this approach. Other sites updates include um, just a reminder that the site AT exam is available online rather than in person at the Prometric facilities. Um, we also have a sites related session coming up in the fall um, at Greenville, which is now a virtual conference, not in person, and the conference on landscape architecture. We have three new site certified projects since our last call that I'll talk about a little bit in the next few slides. We also have two new site pre-certifications in China and Brazil. Um, those remain to be confidential at this time, um, so I can't speak more about those. But overall, site projects run the gamut. Here's a quick snapshot of the 180 registered and certified projects. You can see the various project types. Um, these represent over 246 million gross square feet in 12 countries. Uh, this also covers 38 U.S. states and Washington, D.C. Let's take a look at some of the most recent certified projects. As the first site certified project in British Columbia and the second in Canada, the University of British Columbia's library garden has revitalized their outdoor space to serve as a welcoming outdoor living room that fosters social connection and mental restoration for students, faculty, and visitors. Views to the outdoors, such as the images to the left, are one of the key aspects of one of our credits 6.4, support mental restoration, for example. The site provides many other benefits, such as managing stormwater runoff, enhancing its ecological value, and using appropriate and responsible materials. The Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center is a key element in framing the garden and providing a First Nations presence at this historical center of campus. The plant material selected was coordinated with the, I'm probably not gonna say this right, the Musqueam representatives. Um, given its scale, history, and prominence, and cultural importance, the redesign of the library garden represents one of the most important public realm design initiatives by the university, as stated by them. Another recently certified project is the AT&T Discovery District, completed at the end of uh, 2019. It's located on the southern edge of downtown Dallas. 
The project was designed so the community could learn about the value and benefits of sustainable landscapes and discover the constantly evolving technology that the largest communications company in the world has to offer. Although there were no existing natural elements to conserve due to the project being on an urban infill site, the, the, the downtown location does present uh, other benefits in terms of community connectivity, walkability, public transportation. Also, in, in addition, the new landscape eliminates the need for potable water. This was accomplished through careful plant selection and utilizing a water reclamation system. About 60% of the plants installed uh, are native to the region. Visual and physical access to vegetation is available throughout the site, and specifically the grove. Multiple trees were added to provide shade and respite from the sun. The district also provides other amenities like bike racks, emergency call, po call boxes, free Wi-Fi, drinking fountains to support site users. On-site bike lanes meander through the site and connect to the city's bike network, allowing users to take advantage of the bike share programs and assist local residents, local workforce, and 18 employees that wish to bike to work or for pleasure. Other physical activity programs are offered like yoga, tai chi. Um, it's also designed to be a premier destination for employees and visitors alike, showcasing the latest technologies, trending movies, and concerts. With the goal to be more inclusive, the project achieved innovation points by offering a hearing loop throughout the site exclusively for hard of hearing and deaf members of the community and visitors who wear telequil hearing devices. The project also demonstrates a reinvestment to the local community by reviving the space downtown, but also over 80% of the construction subcontractors, subcontracts for the plaza were awarded to local businesses. Our third certified project is located in Atlanta, Georgia. So in 2019, the city of Atlanta addressed the need for a new parking garage near the Zoo Atlanta and the Atlanta Beltline, responding to demands to reduce traffic congestion and improve overall safety, safety in this area. The project replaced the existing eight acre parking lot with an aesthetically pleasing semi underground parking garage with a seven and a half acre green roof, so uniquely located on top of this garage, which is also seeking Park Smart certification, another GBCI program. This new green space blends into the surrounding landscape. As you can see here, it includes a restaurant that's also seeking LEED certification and other features such as a bandstand, a shaded plaza, terrace seating, water feature, and pedestrian overpass are also here. And other sustainable features include a stormwater management system that consisting of cisterns, infiltration trenches, and a wet pond that manage the site's 80th percentile precipitation event. Uh, by, by preserving healthy native plants, the project also supports the habitat and water storage for infiltration on site. And addition, additionally, by using this vegetation and reflective materials, it reduces the heat island effect. Uh, the project has minimized negative effects on microclimate and human and wildlife habitat. The project has also implemented multiple design elements to improve human health and social activity. We have many other projects in the pipeline implementing sites. The list of registered projects is on our website under the directory, and those are ones that are not noted as confidential. Um, some are mentioned also in this recent article by my colleague on the call, Paul Wessel. Uh, this includes projects like Colby College in Maine, which has one certified project and is underway with two more. There's also two community resilience centers located in California, a park in Kirkland, Washington, that is embedded within an almost six mile old railroad line being transformed into a stunning linear park for walking and biking and a site for future transit. Pretty exciting. So please check out that article on our website. So before I pass to our guest speakers, I want to share a bit of context within the rating system for today's main topic. As you know, the rating system follows the typical design and development process. Health and well-being are covered in almost every section of the rating system in different ways such as creating an aesthetically pleasing educational amenity out of a stormwater feature that's reconnecting us to natural processes, which is found in section three on site design water, or to using vegetation to reduce urban heat island effects, improving health and quality of life for the community as a whole, like in section four, or to promoting the use of healthy materials in section five, or to pro protecting air quality for site workers and site users during construction and maintenance. 
And ultimately, a site is not healthy and sustainable if it is not equitable and address community and site user needs, which is addressed in section two, among other credits. And of course, an entire section is dedicated to human health and well-being that ranges from protecting historical and cultural places, supporting local businesses, promoting equitable site use, to designing spaces for various health benefits, improving our physical and mental health, and encouraging social connection and strengthening community. In recent times, it's nearly impossible to miss the growing emphasis on, on the importance of being outside in parks and green belts and other green spaces and the detriment, if not like, like the within nature deficit disorder, this is a recent New York Times article, well not, well, not new to many of us, the global pandemic has highlighted the multitude of benefits we receive from being in nature, even if it is solely a view from vegetation from an office window. We see evidence of this also in, in the architecture field with biophilic design and the evolving interest in creating outdoor work environments, as noted in this recent article at the bottom left. So now I'll pass it to Dr. Kathleen Wolf to dig deeper into the science that supports these health benefits and how these influence the site's credit. Over to you, Kathy. And I'm taking a moment to put my slides up uh, to share with you all. This should be happening momentarily. There we are. Uh, Hello, everyone. Such a pleasure to be here. Uh, I appreciate the invitation from uh, Danielle representing sites and, of course, the U.S. Green Building Council. And I'm going to take just a few minutes to share uh, some of the information, research information and evidence regarding human health and um, nearby nature, what I term nearby nature, which is the full range of the sorts of places that Danielle just shared with us. And so here's a, a very quick outline, a uh, little bit about the research evidence, some economic value, and a focus on mental health, which seems to be more prominent in people's minds now uh, during the COVID-19, various social distancing and stay-at-home policies. I'll, I'll just mention that um, as a social scientist, I sometimes feel I'm confirming the obvious, particularly with landscape designers. Uh, but on the other hand, I imagine you encounter clients uh, local government decision makers, uh, users in the community who may not realize the depth of benefit and the importance of having nature in their lives. And so hopefully I'll offer some information that you can use and share in those sorts of conversations. So there's quite a wide range of benefits, human health benefits associated with nature contact and in the most essential places of our lives, nearby parks, yards, streetscapes, and so on. And while science is premised on this notion of ecosystem services, it's, it's a little abstract for some people who don't have say a natural resources or landscape background. Another term that you might find helpful is the social determinants of health. And this is now really um, quite widely used uh, in the public health realm and in the medical world. So should you be talking with potential partners in these disciplines, social determinants of health uh, address this need for a comprehensive, a state of complete health, not just the absence of disease. And we now know, again, this has been known for some time, but it's being articulated more clearly that there are a wide range of instances, situations, and contexts around us that influence our health. So often yet we think about human health as the consequence of individual decisions or genetic propensity and so on. But really education, access to adequate housing and good nearby nature, quality nearby nature, is um, uh, these, these influences can, can be mo more substantial even than the household and individual uh, determinants of health. 
Uh, there is a wide range of this research, and I so enjoyed serving uh, on one of the site's te technical communities, uh, com committees, excuse me, with regard to nature and health to help develop those credits. And that was some time ago. Uh, I was kind of surprised. I looked back, and I believe it was over a decade ago that we initiated that process. So um, people um, often are interested in this topic. Again, if you're sharing with clients, users, decision makers, um, the, the research uh, literature can be difficult to access. So at the University of Washington, we prepared this portal, if you will, an entry point into this science. It's called Green Cities Good Health, the website. And if you go to the website, what you find is a series of about a dozen pages. There are those topics over on the left. Click on one of those, and it provides a very brief overview of the topic, a few fast facts, some of the statistical highlights, and then a longer essay, all fully cited should anyone want to know anything about the original research. So here's kind of the guts. Here's if you lift the hood on Green City's good health. Uh, we have now collected thousands of articles spanning about 40 years of this research. And what this figure represents is um, the, the weight of evidence, if you will, on different topics. So for instance, active living, the longest bar there, uh, that topic represents about 14% of the entire article collection. Some years ago, I did some studies on safe streets, the role of trees in urban streetscapes, crash rates, things like that. And very little research has been done about that, despite engineers sometimes telling us, no, we can't have trees in the roadside. Uh, they're just a crash risk. Well, not quite as bad as, as we're led to believe at times. That said, all of these different topics represented in Green City's Good Health, uh, the weight of evidence um, with regard to these, I want to call out one, and that is culture and equity, which is in the center of that collection. Of late, there has been uh, an increased attention to equity with regard to nature, presence, quality, and accessibility. And so that bar would probably be a little longer now. Um, and what we're recognizing is some deep disparities with regard to access to having nature, to having trees, to having parks in one's community, and that they're safe, secure, and have the, the uh, elements and facilities that enable people to use them. I'll also call out if each of these bars has multiple colors within, and that relates to a year, years of publication. Notice this trend. I graduated uh, from university with the PhD in the 1990s. Not a lot going on then. Had a hunch, my colleagues, my peers, we had a hunch that this was something emerging but not a lot of science had been done. Now look in this decade, just the first five years, we need to update these bars, but I suspect that bar would be quite extensive in the gray zones. Um, the pace of publication about all this is just surging right now, all around the world, all around the world. It's really remarkable. What do we see? Again, I have 15, 20 minutes here. Uh, to address thousands of articles, a deep, deep, deep tradition of research in this now. Uh, so here are some highlights. What we see across these articles is, first of all, nature promotes wellness, general wellness. It's protective. As the public health officials say, nature protects health in terms of physical activity. If we're physically active in a routine way, uh, habitual sort of way, uh, it, it helps reduce so many chronic diseases. It helps reduce stress. It, bro it, it boosts our creativity, some interesting studies with regard to that and so on. But also in regard to therapy, thinking about clinical diagnosis, you go to the doctor, there's a concern, um, maybe there's a, a recommendation for a change in diet, medications and uh, life uh, habits. Um, so nature has been found, nature experiences of, of particular types have been found to provide therapeutic benefit in combination, say, with what we think of as traditional medical practices. And, and I find that this distinction um, is, is helpful as a way to talk to different potential partners or clients in the design and landscape realm. 
Um, what can we do within the site's projects to promote wellness in the most general sense and for all users? But then might there be opportunities at times to collaborate to provide these therapeutic uh, opportunities, say within hospital or clinic situ situations or in schools or elder care facilities? So what is this all worth? And, and I know that um, designers, uh, the bottom line, of course, the budget for a project, and um, there are very tangible costs, the costs of the design process itself, the specifications, the materials, the construction, and so on. And it's not always so easy then to show the back end, what is the return on that investment? And that's something that I've begun to explore in a very, very beginning kind of way. Um, we talk about supply and demand, the classical uh, uh, thought or uh, way of determining price for things, but these are tangible things. How do we determine value for those things that are not as tangible and, and perhaps are experienced by many, many people who don't necessarily hold or own an object? Well, let me start with uh, pointing out the cost of health in uh, the United States. And frankly, there, there's equivalent sort of patterns in many um, of the more developed nations. Um, so these are leading causes of death in the United States. Uh, not surprising, cardiovascular and cancer, way up there, respiratory disease. Uh, we'll probably see a bit of a bump in some of these, of course, of course with now COVID-19 treatment. And not only that, but some people not going to the hospital for treatment of some of these things, and so perhaps worsening um, their conditions. So I would guess in the next couple of years, we'll see some changes in this. But the point is, look at these um, health concerns. These are not one time to the doctor, get an antibiotic, and in a couple of weeks, you're done. No, these are long-term, ongoing, ongoing treatments, expensive treatments prior to death in the lead up to that, that loss of life. Here's another way of looking at that. This shows different types of chronic diseases. I won't talk about the specifics of all those lines. The point here is the bottom, uh, the horizontal axis shows age, human age. And what we see is first an increase in those health concerns as we age, not surprising. But what I found remarkable when I first saw this is that we stack people as we age and develop these chronic diseases, there tends to be a stacking. So cardiovascular, often connected to diabetes, often connected to other things. Again, all of these very costly to treat and manage over time. What, here's, here's the, uh, the big picture. We spend so much in this nation on healthcare an astounding amount on average per person, annual per capita, which equals trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars every year, to the point that it's an 18% um, portion of our gross domestic product. We spend a remarkable amount of money in this nation on healthcare. And I have some numbers there for Pennsylvania. You can find these sorts of numbers for every state. So whether, wherever you may be, um, there are sources to go and find these sorts of numbers, again, to help build the case that health is expensive. And if we can knock off a few of these dollars by having quality green space in our communities, there's a return on investment. I have done, I've been working with some economists of late to attempt to uh, understand what might be some of these uh, economic benefits. This was one article, it's a, it's a, it, we're just scratching the surface on this. I'm trying to now to do an equivalent sort of estimation based on having urban forest uh, canopy trees present in communities. But here we see the possibility of three to seven-ish billion dollars a year in savings if people have quality landscapes in their everyday environments for a range of different uh, health concerns and benefits. Uh, so the academic articles that represent that work, not so easy to read. I know how that goes. Also sometimes not easy to access. They can be expensive. 
So we um, summarize this information in partnership with the Nature Conservancy in this brochure called Nature's Riches. And it is available, it's free. Uh, if you search that with Google, Nature Conservancy, Nature's Riches, it should come up. And within that brochure, what we've done is to look at health benefits across the human life cycle, infants, children, adults, older adults, what are some of the evidence what is some of the research evidence that suggests um, economic benefit? Um, and then there's a few of the calculations of, of those annual savings uh, that we've done before. And I should thank uh, the economists that helped out with this. Steve Grado, Mark Measles at Mississippi State University, uh, Alicia Robbins, postdoc with me at the time, now working for Warehouser, doing wonderful things. Um, uh, international forestry uh, sustainability, the economics of that. She's gone on to bigger and better things. All right, um, I'm going to close this out then with a focus on one particular dimension of landscape, trees, gardens, parks, and, and health, and that is mental health. And uh, uh, just by virtue of um, media contacts, colleagues reaching out to me, um, the elevation of mental health as a concern with COVID, uh, we're all aware of it. We're seeing, we're seeing that over and over and maybe experiencing it personally is um, shelter at home, being socially isolated, physical distancing. We, we may, and the anxiety, the uncertainty of, of coronavirus, uh, mental health is, has become prominent in, in, um, the, as a social determinant or as a social expression of health. So let me share a few of these studies with you. Uh, this session will be recorded, yes, so you could go back and get this content, but I'll also provide a link. I'll provide these slides. Most of this research has been done with public funding. So if you find these slides valuable, um, maybe you'd like to go back and, and review some of the content. First of all, Physical activity, so important for so many chronic diseases to help alleviate or even eliminate chronic diseases. Um, here was a study, what they did was they looked at um, a comparison across various studies of people who were active indoors, say at a gym or their home exercise machine, and people who were active outdoors. And they found an additional layer of benefit over and above being active. Uh, from being uh, uh, doing these activities outdoors. Greater sense of revitalization, reduced tension, confusion, and perhaps greater willingness to continue this habit, to continue these activities, uh, uh, which is really important. Motivation is quite important. And yet the, the presence of green, the use of green in these times and when we resume whatever normal lives will become, um, there's so much more value in exercise than exercise in being outdoors. I'll just call out one of these images on the top right. Legacy Health has this wonderful series of healing gardens throughout their hospital system. And with COVID and social distancing, they are now limiting the use of these places only to the hospital staff, the doctors, nurses, technicians, and so on because they're finding with the increased demand on their services, their emotions, uh, they're finding value in taking breaks and being in these spaces. And not only that, they're, they're opening them to the staff 24 hours, you know, um, uh, 24 seven, and also offering programs to encourage people to come into the green space, to relax, to enjoy a snack, to enjoy some music and so on. Uh, if you'd like to get the really big picture and the current evidence about nature and mental health, a colleague of mine, uh, Greg Bratman, has uh, published this article with a number of other colleagues. And what they have done is to summarize in this flow chart how and why we respond well in terms of mental health. And it depends on the type of nature there at the very top, the nature features. It depends on the exposure. How much time? Where? Who else might be with us? Uh, and that then um, leads into um, ideas about dosage. That's really a hot topic now in this research is this idea of dosage, sort of try to find the equivalent to treatment regimes that doctors, the way they think about all of this. 
And then what are the various effects? And um, I, that's what I'm talking about here. We're seeing a range of positive effects associated with nature experiences. So this is a, a great go-to article just published a short while ago if you'd like to really do a deep dive about all of this. Again, some examples. Um, this work was done at the University of Michigan. Uh, people were asked to do routine outdoor experiences. It was an experiment, high bar for science. It was an experiment rather than an observational study. And what they found was just 20 to 30 minutes. So that's important with this dosage is we're not talking about going away from the city to, you know, to the national park or state park. This happens, it can happen immediately in our communities, in our own yards perhaps, or in the places that you are designing and sharing with the community. 20 to 30 minutes. What they also found was that people who were least active, but then entered this experiment and became more active, uh, a greater reduction in a stress biomarker. Uh, and the, I'll tell you, from, an ex, from a research standpoint, 20%, 28% differences, that is substantial in this kind of work. Uh, here's one of those therapeutic examples. Mark Berman, now at the University of Chicago, uh, experimental, recruited people who were diagnosed with depression, clinical diagnosis. People are going for walks. And uh, what we see is that uh, with um, those who were in more green spaces, green residential areas, fairly short time, 50 minute walks, better mood, affect, better cognition, better ability to concentrate on tasks and get things done. So walking in nature, here we go again, that combination of physical activity and the nature setting. But why? why? Why does this help us? Well, here's one theory, the idea of rumination. So psychologically, we tend, humans tend to focus on the negative and can get into kind of a negative spiral of self-thought. Um, and so what the studies are showing is that by being in nature, um, we tend to kind of pull back on that rumination. We start, we find things around us and the sensory experiences help to reduce or um, diminish that tendency to ruminate. And that can be quite helpful for general mental health as well as depression. Uh, the, U the UK, the United Kingdom, England in particular has a national health service and they're on board with outdoor experiences for health, including they're setting up these group walking opportunities, group walking programs. So that might be an element that adds to the designs that you're doing is thinking about the program that you might recommend to the client. So group walks, what they find here, you're seeing the pattern, you're seeing the trend, lower depression, greater positive mood, uh, synergize with physical activity to improve mood and mental well-being. Uh, and uh, biodiversity. So ecologists are now starting to enter this and collaborate with people who do either social science or public health work or whatever. And um, here, what we're seeing is there's a few studies, not a lot, but there's a few studies suggesting that greater biodiversity, greater use of native, native plants, conservation of existing landscapes um, may have a greater or may have an additional beneficial effect on depression, anxiety, and stress. And so here you see with more cover, 20% cover, less depression, 30% cover, again, of native material, greater complexity, less anxiety, and so on. By the way, um, my daughter sent me this picture a couple of months ago. She said, she knows I'm a birder. She said, mom, is this photoshopped? What's with this color? And, you know, so I explained indigo bunting. She grew up in the West Coast here in Seattle, so she'd never seen those before. You in the East, um, probably have experienced these wonderful birds. Um, there's an uh, interesting experimental study done in a laboratory. The investigators created images that showed a gradual progression percentage of tree cover, canopy cover, and then measured stress response. Here is what they learned is that um, the, the red line is showing that gradual control progression of canopy cover. So it's a fairly uniform line. 
the blue line shows stress reduction. So the higher the blue line, the less stress. It's an inverse sort of representation. Um, but even though it, it jumps about a bit, you see there is a strong trending in stress reduction with more canopy. What's really interesting about this study is it, it sort of leveled out at about 37, 38, 40% canopy. You still see some stress reduction, but at a diminishing rate. So that's kind of interesting to think about how does this affect policy or, or how we, um, over a larger project around a community or neighborhood, what might be a goal for canopy cover or the amount of vegetation in people's surroundings? So again, why is there value in nature with regard to mental health? Rachel and Stephen Kaplan, who I studied with at the University of Michigan, have uh, long ago offered attention restoration theory. And I see this playing out now is we're so focused on screens, we're very task oriented, uh, we're less able to go out and, and um, uh, have a, a broader range of experiences. And this directed attention can fatigue um, how we think and our capacity to think. And we can begin to feel frustration uh, or, or sometimes become more impulsive in our behavior, make kind of rash decisions. Some There's even been some su studies suggesting that aggression can be heightened if we're feeling this cognitive fatigue and tension. So as designers, um, I suspect that you intuitively understand these sorts of things, but the Kaplan's have put some labels on some of the elements that we can introduce in design to help with cognitive fatigue. First is even in the smallest of spaces, creating a sense that you're being away from that space or experience that's um, causing the fatigue. Um, extent, have, having enough space that feels comfortable and that it's compatible. It has seating, um, it has the, the, the facilities and, and elements that are compatible with the particular user population. But soft fascination, I think, is a key one here. And that is that we can look at things, enjoy the detail, um, see a variety of things that draw us to them and pull us from um, that very directed uh, activity that we've been doing. So to wrap up here, nearby nature, it's not just nice to have. It is profoundly important in communities. And nature is a social determinant of health, supported by extensive scientific evidence. We knew that when we were developing the site's human health and well-being credits. If we were to revisit those credits, I think we would find much more to share and uh, offer as uh, design um, guidance. Um, and it's really important to know and, and to recognize that this is not yet readily available to all. It is an equity concern, and that is being heightened uh, in my own work, in the communities that I work with for research, uh, to, to understand how to provide this nature in an equitable way uh, to all people, and in ways that reflect their particular cultural, ethnographic, or, or local concerns and local interests. This is the uh, location where you can find these slides if you go to nature within what's new at the top within on the top right there within about 24 hours i will have a pdf of these slides and i now turn this over back to you uh, for our next presenter thank you very much everyone Okay, Mark, it's all, all your, in your hands. Does everybody see the slide? Hello, everyone. I'm uh, going to talk to you a little bit about the Section 6 credits and, and how a site-certified project can improve health and well-being of staff, and visitors, and community users. Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens is a special place. We celebrate our history and the splendor of our glass houses, and we practice and promote sustainability. Our mission is to inspire and educate all with the beauty and importance of plants and to advance sustainability as well as human and environmental well being through action and research. Next slide. Today, we're focusing on the Section 6 Human Health and Well Being credits, which promotes access to nature, 
outdoor opportunities for physical activity, mental restoration, social interaction, and social justice. Through our actions and design, we hope to build stronger communities, promote human health and well being by putting into practice the principles of sustainability, wellness, regenerative thinking, and biophilia. Next slide. So, credit 6.1 protect and maintain cultural historic places. Well, at Phipps, we, we are a cherished institution in Pittsburgh, having been a key ingredient in the wellness medicine if you will, for Pittsburghers since 1893. Phipps architectural grandeur and beautiful plant displays, you can, there you go, um, have provided relief from Pittsburgh's industrial past, the days of steel and pollution, smokestacks and soot. The medicine is in the form of beautiful, lush and colorful displays and exhibits. Area families have built, built traditions around the seasonal shows and display gardens for decades. And, Today, visitors to Phipps are learning about the importance of sustainability and climate change. We are right out front in our commitment to sustainability. If you came today, you would be greeted by a row of 15 or so 55 gallon drums representing how much oil would be saved by an average family shifting, switching to renewable energy every year. Uh, next slide. Credit 6.2 provide optimum site access, safety, and wayfinding. Well, you want to provide visitors and staff safe, accessible, easy to navigate pathways and outdoor spaces. Staff and visitors alike want clear, safe, and comfortable pedestrian walks. The goal is to eliminate confusion. You want to provide clear views as you approach entrances to buildings and outdoor spaces, as well as pathway intersections. The clarity of pedestrian routes, spatial connectivity, and views to building entrances and landscape features makes for happier visitors and staff, which will attract more visitors. And of course, that's good for business. So, you know, it's not just about, you know, the, the layout, so to speak. It's, it's about sort of the comfort that people feel um, when things are connected rightly. Uh, so credit 6.3, uh, next slide, support equitable site use. You want to engage users and stakeholders in the early design stages. Listen to what the community needs and wants. And it's not always related to community access or making different kinds of programs accessible to all. It, it could be about research. For example, for our CSL project, that's the Center for Sustainable Landscapes, uh, colleges and environmental agencies, uh, local colleges, and environmental agencies, such as Pitt and CMU and PWSA, Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, uh, participated in the early stages of the design. And they listed access to Phipps green infrastructure features and monitoring data as a significant need. So we implemented, implemented green infrastructure uh, monitoring. And, and it could be just listening to stakeholders and um, community representatives talking about the kind of things that are important to them and then trying to implement that. In order to promote equitable site use, you need to notify and advertise. Okay, you need to get the word out. It's important to provide online communication about events and promotions. And you wanna provide free public access to a variety of activities. These are required uh, elements for you know, getting these credits. Uh, such as uh, we have a May market uh, plant sale, which is pretty popular. It's a big, big event. Uh, we have weekly farmers market. Um, Phipps has a green cafe with outdoor dining, it, and it is uh, very, very green as far as recycle, recycling and composting. Um, so free public access to outdoor botanical gardens and free parking were available. All of those things are, are important in providing you know, equal access uh, to our, um, our iconic uh, conservatory. Um, so the next slide is credit 6.4, support mental restoration. When the Center for Sustainable Landscapes building, over 50% of the interior building common spaces have views to nature, which is a credit requirement. Um, Phipps promotes the principles of biophilia, which recognizes the importance of the human 
nature connection. Uh, seeding for 5% of total site users is required. People have ready visual physical access to rich native plant landscapes. There are many environmental and social benefits to experiencing these landscapes, you know, particularly for staff every day, but for visitors to the, to the, uh, to the conservatory. Uh, there are views to flora and fauna, textures, movement of fo foliage, fragrances and dappled shade, sounds of water and views to nature around the CSL building. And, and to also to include neighboring Shenley Park, which nearly surrounds our campus. All contribute to uplifting moods and enjoyable work days. What, what could be better than that? It's important to reduce noise through earth berms, walls, bar and barriers, even scheduling maintenance at landscape maintenance activities early in the morning, maybe before working hours, before the public arrives uh, in the morning, uh, so there's no noise, or use battery operated tools. All, those kinds of things make it make a difference. It all it all combines to a way of thinking and sort of weaves together um, with all of the good things that come about from you know, sustainability and, and thinking in terms of regenerative regenerate. uh, Water features that are part of the storm system, such as fountains, reflecting pools, reduced unwanted noise and create visual interest. Our lagoon generates relaxing water sounds, including the sounds of wildlife, such as birds, frogs, fish splashing, all provide peaceful sounds. Single benches around the lagoon and and on our roof garden provide beautiful, peaceful views to surrounding nature. Low walls and plantings that limit noise and provide a sense of enclosure are also important. Uh, next slide, credit 6.5, support physical activity. Uh, we all know the benefits of physical fitness. Um, Phipps has an on-site half mile trail that connects to Shenley Park, to the Shenley Park trail system, which is pretty extensive. Uh, which and it's which is adjacent to Phipps. Um, th that's a credit requirement to have that ha half mile trail. Uh, Phipps adopted Michelle Obama's Let's Move program and spearheads the Let's Move Pittsburgh branch, which promotes healthy lifestyles for families. Phipps hosts children's camps and educational programs that support health and wellness. So again, you know, it all sort of weaves together in creating, in you know, sort of a. Um, uh, relaxed, you know, he healthy demeanor, I guess you could say, um, with all, all of these things coming together. They, they all interact and they all relate. Um, next slide, six, credit 6.6, .6, support social connection. Provide and use outdoor classroom spaces for meetings, gathering and working, provide wireless access, uh, provide movable seating, have meetings and docent-led tours, which often stop on our green roof which is sort of unintended, but there's spaces to sit up there um, and socialize. But people go up there because you can get this commanding view that provides an overview of the entire project and you can talk about the project. So the docents like to come up to the roof. Various types of seating, single and multiple benches, walls and portable seating are provided. Seating for 10% of total site users is required. Um, we, we like to think that our lagoon boardwalk is a good gathering space to socialize, particularly children like to gather near the edge with the instructors. Uh, and so is our outdoor amphitheater, which provides another dimension of seating to watch a teacher or somebody demonstrate or just to sit there um, or have a meeting there. Um, so next slide, credit 6.7 provide on-site food production. We actually didn't attempt that credit uh, at the time, um, but um, we do have extensive edible gardens uh, all outside the project area of the CSL. And um, we have a homegrown program that goes into local communities, um, promoting raised bed gardens and fresh food. But I will say that on our, on our green roof, um, we do have edible plants. So there's a little aspect of permaculture there. We have raspberries and aronia berries and some of our viburnums are edible. The birds don't get them all. Um, so uh, nearly done here. Um, also wanna uh, just mention, you know, the importance, I don't have a slide on this, but you know, the, the credit 6.9 encourage fuel efficient multimodal transportation. That does have an effect on your well-being too, because if you're taking the, the bus, 
Uh, you know, might have a walking uh, trip from the bus stop up to Phipps. Um, and also, you know, we have incentive programs. You know, you can uh, save two dollars a day if you don't bring your car to work. So just those kinds of things again all com combine to sort of weave this um, another not another dimension of working life and uh, community life in the in the section six credits. So uh, we do truly feel that our site certified project improves the health and well being of our staff and visitors to Phipps. Uh, and I think I'm about out of time, so thank you very much. Back to you, Danielle. Thank you, Mark. Am I, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, I've had the pleasure of being at um, the Center for Sustainable Landscapes in person, and it is a really beautiful place. Um, so we're glad that it came back to recertify it. And I, I do want to point out that the site center for the FIP Center for Sustainable Landscapes was a was a pilot project that came back later to recertify under the new version. So that was pretty, makes it even more unique. Um, and thank you, Kathleen, for a great presentation. Your wealth of information. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so as this graphic here illustrates, sites encourages parks and other open spaces to view and prioritize human health and well-being for individuals and for a community as a whole. And as you can see, credits in nearly every section of the site's rating system influence how we can promote a healthy human habitat in one way or another. This could be for how we, how we select the sites, so making sure they're walkable, um, or for example, or to designing engaging inclusive outdoor spaces that encourage people to be outside and gain the many physical and mental health benefits. In addition, the green infrastructure like rain gardens encourages us to experience and understand natural processes. The use of native vegetation gives us a sense of place and regional identity. And honoring local culture and history and promoting social equity through fair wages and job training, free public access, for example, are also needed to achieve that site's goal of enhancing human well-being and strengthening community. Um, thank you again for joining us today. Before we head into questions, just please note a few upcoming events on July 29th. Where please join us if you can, USGBC's town hall for a discussion with our GBCI president and CEO, myself and others on how sites is an important GBCI program in transforming the market and helping to achieve healthy, equitable, and resilient future for all. We also have two more sites community calls. These are all on our events page, and we'll share more details if you have an interest in a certain topic or speaker or project, please let us know. We can email sites at usgbc.org, or sorry, sites at gbci.org or through the chat. And now we'll move it on to questions, the few minutes we have. Thank you, Danielle. Um, this is Anna Grace. We've had a couple of questions come through. I'd like to just go ahead and direct the first one to Dr. Wolf. Um, the question was, thank you for compiling this information. It's very valuable. How do we bridge these health outcomes to the developers behind the project? So speaking broadly, if they don't benefit directly, they don't invest. Is there a unique opportunity with our current COVID state? Dr. Wolf, you're actually on mute. Well, thank you. Development process encourages the short-term gain, even though users um, may uh, users and residents may may uh, benefit uh, in, over a very long time. Uh, uh, one thing that I'm doing is attempting to, you know, hey, there's carrot and stick, right? And one thing that I'm doing now in my work is to attempt to translate all of this evidence to policy guidelines which could be interpreted into perhaps development requirements that there be these spaces. And I have seen um, that LEED certification, I don't know if this has happened with sites, but LEED certifications have been adopted by some institutions, even some local governments. Elements of LEED have been incorporated into development requirements and permitting requirements. That's perhaps not the most favorable solution in terms of building that relationship with developers, but maybe that's something we think about. One is to provide clear 
guidelines for how nature can be incorporated into the spaces that are being developed, which may make them more marketable. There's a little bit of research about that. On the other hand, perhaps promoting that some of the sites um, uh, considerations and credits be incorporated into local code so that they become institutionally part of the development process. And I can quick, and I can quickly uh, chime in about the where sites has been adopted so far. The U.S. General Services Administration has adopted sites for all their new capital construction projects. They have. Um, over 14 uh, courthouses, land port of entries, other federal office buildings that are pursuing sites. Um, we had two that went through the pilot program that achieved certification. And uh, we also, um, the state of Rhode Island has adopted sites for its public projects, as well as um, the Atlanta Beltline project in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, adopted where they all new design parts have to meet sites um, certification. Thank you, Danielle. The next question could be for either presenter, but I'd like to direct it at Mark first. Um, thank you for the inspiring examples, um, such as FIPS. Um, the question is, how do we present these to folks who are outside of those group of people who get it? What is the what is the most effective way we can communicate the um, benefits of sites like this project to make a broader impact? Uh. I think probably the best way to achieve that is through uh, marketing, um, through uh, you know communication, um, and I, I I know Phipps we we I think do a pretty good job of um, reaching out and making uh, as many um, elements in the community and in the, in the region aware of of what we what we offer in terms of you know continuing education, you know visits, attractions, whatever. Um, but I, I, it's, it's, it's all, it all comes down to communication, I, 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 I think. Uh, anybody else has, has another thought on that, but that's how I would look at it. Thank you, Mark. Um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I could add a little to that is, again, from this research perspective, some of the earliest research about um, park access was simply GIS proximity. So here are households and what is the buffer around a park and how, how many households. Then it went a little more sophisticated because we can't, we know that people don't walk as a crow flies. There are barriers such as freeways or, or topographic. So now there's a little more sophisticated analysis of people's access to places. The, the most current research, some of it done by um, the RAND Corporation and uh, Parks, Parks and Rec Association, uh, finding that the elements within the park or within the green space are really important. And then the next level is program. So Mark and the Phipps Conservatory just seems like it's um, really paid a lot of attention to program. So what are the activities on the site that are not only welcoming people, but might have a cultural or life cycle aim. So programs for children, programs for elders. Um, in a way, it's not only a marketing, it's an invitation. We, we welcome you and uh, either tell us a little bit more about what you'd like to see in this facility, or here's what we offer and, and hope you'll enjoy it. Um, so it becomes a relationship in, in some sense. Good point. Good point. And I do want to add to that. Um, SITE does work on um, guiding that process. So to change that outcome toward a more sustainable and inclusive project, we do uh, really look at the process of how to get there. So the SITE process front loads a lot of attention early on, early on to um, identifying who the SITE users would be, the stakeholders, engaging with the community, finding out what their needs are, with the four different kinds, four so different kinds of groups, like whether it's children or families or elderly, and how to um, understand what their needs are, and then design the programming and design the site to um, make it a wel welcoming and engaging place. So, like from the beginning to the kind of throughout the rating system, identifies different points to um, try to address all that. Right. Right. 
Mark, I think you um, references in your presentation um, about sound, but we have a question from an attendee asking if we can point them in the direction of any studies, um, literature studies available on the impacts of natural sounds on mental health. Boy, um, I just know from experience, um, observation, practice over the years, not, not a, I'm sure there is something out there if you, if you research it and um, maybe, maybe Dr. Wolf might know something on that, but uh, I, I, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I can speak uh, firsthand about road noise because I, I live in a place where we bought, bought this house when this road wasn't well-traveled. So, oh, this is great. Well, now, it's, now it is, and you can hear, it, it, it changes your whole perspective. It, it, it throws you off kilter, so to speak. Um, so, so you need to build earthworms if you can, or fences. Or, um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are many studies about the negative effects of, of unwanted noise. Uh, I can't point you in that direction right now. Sorry. <laughs> I, uh, from a, a research perspective, I'll offer three points. One is, and as Mark just said, there is quite an extensive research about literally the damage, personal damage associated with persistent high decibel sounds in our immediate environment, loss of sleep, anxiety, stress, biomarkers of stress, just from having that sound uh, in, in and around us. The second point is a bit of study and a great bit more of late about how to effectively use landscape as a barrier to sound, particularly high decibel sound. And I know there's been writings about that in the design field for some time. And so I'm speaking from a research perspective where people are literally putting uh, sound sensors within and around these vegetation buffers to understand what is the composition that's most effective. The third is, and what I find really interesting coming to this from a psychology sort of perspective is a couple of studies I've seen um, people are seated in a place, a landscape, quality landscape place. And even though the decibel level is approaching a discomfort level, they perceive the sound as less intrusive versus being in a built place, um, a more um, barren place with the same decibel level. So same decibel levels, concrete, green, they perceive the sound to be less in that green space. Does it have an influence on health? The studies haven't taken that next step to understand that, um, but, I, but I find that really interesting. Thank you, Kathy and Mark again. Uh, we are over time and uh, next time we'll maybe add more time to our calls. Uh, thank you so much. This has been really, um, very informative and inspiring, and I hope it's been that way for others. If you, we didn't answer your questions, we will uh, email you the, uh, any answers, and uh, we will also send information about the CEU and any resources as well. Um, please, again, check out the future events, and have a great day, and safely get outside and enjoy those health benefits. <laughs>